I'm really happy to be here today um, to tell you about one of the impacts climate change is happen having in the ocean that really hasn't had as much focus as I wish it and I hope it will have in the future. So climate change has three impacts in the ocean. It causes the oceans to warm, it causes them to become more acidic, so decrease in pH, and it also causes them to lose oxygen. And so today I'll be focusing on the loss of oxygen from the oceans. Um, and we know that scientifically as ocean deoxygenation. And so the ocean actually takes up more than 90% of the heat that's produced from anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And when the ocean warms, it has some really important consequences like deoxygenation. Um, and unfortunately, this is a fairly new problem. Even scientists have only started addressing it in the last 20 years. And so it hasn't received quite as much attention. But oxygen is fundamental for most life. We breathe oxygen, fish breathe oxygen through their gills. Um, pretty much all of the organisms you see in that coral reef require oxygen to live, and so oxygen is very fundamental. However, climate change actually causes oxygen levels in the ocean to decrease, um, and that's mostly due to warming. And we've actually seen that in the data. Globally, we have seen that the oceans are losing oxygen, and we've already seen biological consequences of this oxygen loss because, again, oxygen is very important to support life. Um, and the groups that are most sensitive to loss of oxygen are actually fish and crustaceans, so crustaceans being our crabs and our lobsters. So these are the groups that are really important for our fisheries, and so that's why a lot of countries should actually be interested in what's going on with oxygen loss on their coastlines and in the open ocean. Um, and so let's just take a moment and take a breath and think about what's in the air that we just inhaled. So about 21% of the air that you just inhaled is oxygen. And as Carol Turley will tell you, there are two lungs on this planet. One of the lungs is the terrestrial lung, and it's producing about half of the oxygen. And the other lung is our ocean lung. That's all of the algae that grow in the oceans, and that's producing 50% of the oxygen we breathe. So a lot of the oxygen that we're getting is actually coming from all of these small phytoplankton in the ocean. Um, in the ocean, there is oxygen, but it's there in a dissolved form, and it's much harder to get out of the water for marine organisms that live in there. And oxygen content in the ocean is dependent on the temperature, the amount of mixing that's occurring at the surface, and then the biology. So biology produces oxygen through photosynthesis, and it uses up oxygen through respiration. So we respire, and all of the organisms in the ocean also respire, thereby using oxygen. And climate change has a negative impact on all three of these. And so we'll just do a little intuition building so we can all become comfortable with why climate change would negatively impact oxygen levels in the ocean. So first of all, warm water holds less oxygen. We can do many experiments in the lab. It's a very s simple physical property, and we see that when temperature increases, the amount of gas that water can hold decreases. And so because of that, just simply when you warm the water, it's going to be able to hold less oxygen. Um, and we can actually see this in the lab, but then we can actually see this in the data from the ocean, where the tropics in light purple are areas with low oxygen, um, and the tropics are the areas with the lowest oxygen at the surface, because warm water can simply hold less oxygen, whereas polar regions have higher oxygen content, just because of the property that the cold water can hold more oxygen. Um, and then warm water is harder to mix, so when you get warming at the surface from climate change, it becomes more difficult to mix that water. When you can mix more water, you can get more oxygen into the water from the atmosphere. When you can mix less water due to that warming, you get a stratified water column. That means that everything outside of that mix layer is no longer in contact with the atmosphere. And a lot of biological respiration is going on at those mid-depth levels. So if you can't mix the oxygen in there, it's going to get depleted much more rapidly. Um, another reason why warming leads to more oxygen use is because when it's warmer, you actually breathe more. You respire more. You use more oxygen. And so that's what's going on in the ocean with all of the organisms that live there. The ocean is full of bacteria. So there are about a million bacteria in every milliliter of seawater. And all of those bacteria are utilizing oxygen. So that, and when the temperatures increase, you also get increased respiration. Um, and so a lot of times you get increased respiration in areas where there's high productivity. So whenever you have a big algae bloom, for example, and once the algae bloom sinks out of the water column, it gets decomposed by all of those bacteria, and that leads to a reduction in oxygen. So whenever you get increased nutrients, whether that's 
through sewage runoff or fertilizer runoff or whenever you get increased nutrients due to upwelling, so coastal circulation, nutrient-rich water coming up, you're going to be in a situation where you have high surface productivity and then more decomposition at depth. Um, and so coastally, we have a lot of hypoxic areas. So hypoxia is simply defined as an oxygen concentration that's detrimental to life. So in most areas, most organisms can't live in a hypoxic zone. Some are specifically adapted for it, but most animals can't live in those areas. And so um, in red, you can see all of the coastal hypoxic zones. There are more than 400 identified now. And so these usually correspond to areas with dense populations. And so these are primarily driven by a lot of nutrient runoff from our farms, from sewage. And so most parts of the world with dense population have these coastal hypoxic zones. And so if you actually go on Google Earth and you go into Google Ocean, you can take a look to see all of the hypoxic areas that have been identified in your own area. So that's us at the National Stadium, and you can see the Baltic Sea actually has quite a few hypoxic zones. Um, there are also open ocean low oxygen zones. We call these oxygen minimum zones. And they're naturally occurring. They're because we have really nutrient-rich water at the surface, and once we have high productivity at the surface and it sinks down and gets decomposed, it utilizes a lot of the oxygen. And so we have these large oxygen minimum zones, particularly in the Pacific. And so in this map, everything that's not gray is a part of the ocean that has hypoxic waters. Um, and so we see really large areas of that in the Pacific, in the Indian Ocean, and then we also have hypoxic areas off of the west coast of Africa. And so where these hypoxic zones actually butt up against the continental margins, that really impacts our fisheries because a lot of our fisheries target the continental margins. And these are large areas where fish, most fish that we like to fish can't live. Um, and so the total hypoxic area on the continental margins, so a lot of the places we like to fish, um, it's greater than the area of Poland and France combined. So you're really talking about large areas where most fish that we like to fish can't live. Um, and so not only are they large in area, they're about 8% of the total ocean area, but they're also very deep. So you can have parts of the ocean where you can have 1,000 meters of water that's hypoxic, which can't support most normal aerobic life. And so one of the main points is that this is a very widespread problem. And probably whether you have a coastal hypoxic zone due to runoff or you have an oceanic zone due to your location, or an oceanic low oxygen zone due to your location, most coastlines actually have a low oxygen problem. And this low oxygen problem gets exacerbated when you experience surface warming because of the properties of how warming affects oxygen content in water. Um, and so we've actually seen um, in our data that there has been a decrease in oxygen. And the new assessment, IPCC assessment five report, actually predicted that by the end of the 21st century, you'll see a three to 6% decline in global oxygen levels in the ocean. But this is just an average value. And so what you actually see in this graph in the blue on the top panel, in the blue you see areas that are already low in oxygen. And then in the second panel, in the blue you see the areas that are going to lose the most oxygen and have lost oxygen already. And what you can see is that the areas that are already limited on oxygen are the ones that are losing the most oxygen. And so that's important. And you can actually see the expansion of these low oxygen areas through the water column. So between 1960 and today, you can see that the depth occupied by these low oxygen hypoxic areas in the water have expanded. Um, and so what that means for us on the coastlines is as these areas expand, they also shoal, so they become shallower. They get closer to our coast, and our coasts now actually face this low oxygen water that is coming up and affecting some of the fish. And we've seen off of the coast of California in the last 22 years, a 21% decrease in mean oxygen content at about 300 meters, and coastally a shoaling of about 100 meters um, of the hypoxic layer. And so where that the depth of the hypoxic layer is what really affects a lot of your coastal organisms. Um, and so what we can see when we look at physiology in the lab is that there are certain groups that are most sensitive to low oxygen. And we can look at this in terms of lethal concentrations, and so what causes an organism to die, or we can look at this with sublethal concentrations, so what causes an organism to grow less or to reproduce less. And we can see that for both of these, crustaceans and fish are our most sensitive groups. 
And we can see that in the lab, but we can also see that in the field. We have mortality events, large mortality events in the Gulf of Mexico. When you get a hypoxic area, you have a low oxygen event, you have dead fish. This is a really fast impact. We also see that off of the coast of Africa where there's low oxygen water that shoals. Crustaceans, lobsters will just walk out of the ocean because the oxygen is too low for them and you'll have a widespread mortality event. And so we can see this most recently off of Oregon where before the Oregon coastline did not have a lot of anoxic and hypoxic events, but recently since 2002 because of the shoaling of this oxygen minimum zone and the slow oxygen water, they've actually been experiencing a lot more low oxygen mortality events. And starting in 2002, they saw 75% mortality of the Dungeness crab, which is a really big, important fishery off of Oregon. And then also in these ROV surveys, you can see a healthy fish community prior to 2002, and then pretty much all of their ROV surveys after 2002 saw a lot of dead fish and invertebrates along the bottom because of these low oxygen events. And so what that means for the greater ocean, um, it results in habitat expansions and contractions. So There's some organisms that actually really like low oxygen because they've been adapted to it through evolutionary time. So this fish on the right actually does great with very low oxygen concentrations. And so organisms like that will see their range expand. But organisms that need high oxygen to survive, and so those are our tunas, our billfish, they actually are experiencing habitat contraction because all of a sudden they can't use as much of the water column as they did previously. And so we've already seen a 15% reduction in the habitat of tuna in the Atlantic um, because of the, sh the expansion of these low oxygen areas. Um, there's also been a decline um, in mesopelagic fish. So these are small midwater fish that are really a very important component of the food web. They feed everything at the top levels of the food web. And so they're very sensitive to low oxygen. Um, and then also we've seen habitat expansion of the Humboldt squid. So the Humboldt squid can do well in low oxygen conditions. And it actually has expanded all along the west coast of the US. Um, and they compete with hake and they also eat hake. So the hake fishery has not been doing as well, but the fishery on Humboldt squid has been doing better. Um, and so a really important point is that low oxygen areas are carbon dioxide maximum areas. Um, whenever you use oxygen, you produce carbon dioxide. That's just through respiration. And so whenever we see an area that's low in oxygen, it's always high in carbon dioxide. So when we see the shoaling of these low oxygen areas, we actually see the shoaling of very low pH water. Um, and so that's exactly what we've been seeing off of the west coast of the United States, where some of the water that's coming up is 7.6, 7.75, very, very low pH. Um, and what that also means is it has very high CO2 concentrations. And so some of these waters are 1,200. Um, and for example, surface is 400 um, parts per million. And so this is actually water that is net fluxing carbon dioxide out of the water instead of taking it up. So there are some important feedback implications. So we really need to pay attention to ocean deoxygenation because it has very important biological effects. We know that it's declining and we know that it will decline in the future um, with, with surface warming. Um, and we know that it probably will have some important impacts for a lot of coastal economies. Um, however, because it's such a new topic, it really hasn't had too much of a focus and it didn't make it into the summary for policymakers, even though it's really a problem policymakers should be thinking about because it can impact their local economies. Um, and so small changes in temperature can have very drastic impacts on oxygen content. So just a one degree increase in surface warming will triple your suboxic zones and increase your hypoxic areas by 10%. Um, we know that it has profound consequences on biodiversity, on fisheries income. Um, and we know that it also has environmental feedbacks in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because a, gr a really potent greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide, is produced in low oxygen areas. And in the historic record, we actually see that um, oxygen depleted areas in the ocean are very tightly correlated with warming periods. So we know how this works in the past. And so with that, I would just like to say thank you for listening to this presentation. And um, I'm here as a part of a group of Scripps students, we're graduate students, and we really want to try and communicate our research to um, more of a public policy audience as well as a public audience. And so there's more information about how climate change is affecting the oceans at this website, oceanscientist.org. And also there's an oceans booth here, 102, on this floor. So if you have any other questions about 
ocean impacts of climate change, um, please come and talk to us. So thank you. <laughs>